can never be solved out there in the world. The problem about money or scarcity, you know, one way the ego would counsel is if you, you know, if you've got a belief in scarcity, would be to, to get a great job and have lots of money. That'll take care of your scarcity. If that's kind of an obvious way of, of dealing with the problem. And here comes the course and is saying that the, the scarcity is a belief in your mind. And the only way that you'll completely ever heal it is, is bring the belief of scarcity to the Holy Spirit. And then the, the belief will be gone. And you won't have the problem anymore. That's what I want to know about. <laughs> 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 now we're good. No, so you haven't said anything I don't know, but I want to know about good. the belief in scarcity being gone, and then I won't have the problem? Because what? I have money? No. No. The perception will change. In other words, I'm just low, Roger. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're not doing one. Well, well, it's good. We're taking this. We'll, we, we can take the issue of the money. We can use that because basically the issue with money or the issue with anything is it's the same thing. I know it's not out there, but I can't figure out how to fix it in here or how to get it fixed or how or is it fixed? I mean, well, I know we've got to have a house to live in. I think I know that, don't I? So what we do is we'll take that. In fact, the. <laughs> There's an early section in the course which the gentleman was just bringing up the illusion of needs, and that's one of the very, very, very earliest ones. It's on page 11. And basically, what Jesus says is the idea of order of needs arose because having made this fundamental error, when the fundamental error is belief in lack, the belief I'm lacking or I'm not complete or whole, having made this fundamental error, you had already fragmented yourself into levels with different needs. As you integrate, you become one, and your needs become one accordingly. Unified needs lead to unified action because this produces a lack of conflict. The idea of orders of need, which follows from the original error that one can be separated from God, requires correction at its own level before the error of perceiving levels at all can be corrected. So, let's take it, let's bring it back to the practical. <coughs> When we think about the world, if we think of ourselves as a person in a world, okay, it seems that we have needs on different levels. In other words, we can talk about the mental level, maybe. We can talk about the emotional level. Is anybody familiar with like Maslow's hierarchy of needs? You know, where he talked about we have basic levels of needs: food, clothing, warmth, sex, you know, so on and so forth. Maslow also also talked about like self-actualization needs. You know. Of, of reaching your full potential. Let's let's pull it back even more specific. I mean, if we went around the room and talked about things that we were really interested in and really believed in, you know, some people may talk about environmental issues, you know, wanting to have a clean earth, or some people may talk about wildlife issues or save the rainforest. Other people may talk about you know eradicating AIDS. Other people may say, well, that's fine, but you know, I've got big interpersonal problems with my husband or my daughter right now or financial needs, you know, or maybe it's sickness, you know, a, a chronic condition or a disease. You know, there's so many different ranges and levels. It seems like save the dolphins and cancer and my interpersonal inter 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 relationships with my mother are like, you know, are like really different things. And this is what we're talking about, about the illusion of levels of need. When Jesus gets, like in lessons 79 and 80, he says, let me recognize the problem so it can be solved. And then let me recognize that my problems have been solved. If you read that, you know, point blank, you know, listen, Eddie, let me recognize that my problems have been solved. It's like, wait a minute, I don't feel that way. It seems like every day I've got to deal with, with problems, interpersonal problems and, you know, survival and so on and so forth. And so what this course is offering, what Jesus is saying is that you only have one problem and there is one solution. Isn't that nice to think that it's, that it's so simple? Haven't all of us felt that if there is such thing as truth, it would be simple instead of really complex? So he tells us that there's one problem and that there's one solution. Now, what, we're, what we get into is what we were just talking about, too, is that if I perceive the problem to be in the world, then it's it can't be solved because the Holy Spirit is that one answer to that one problem. And the Holy Spirit is in the mind. God did not place the answer 
where the problem wasn't. He didn't place the answer out on the screen. He didn't place the answer in the world. He placed the answer in the mind of his sleeping son. And that's where the Holy Spirit is. So the Course constantly says, bring your illusions to the truth. Bring your false belief to the light, to the Holy Spirit in your mind. The false ideas and the false beliefs that are in the mind and everything are all what I would call backwards. They all have the, the basic essence that, that there's something out there on the screen that's causative. That, and my mind is the effect. In other words, what you were mentioning when it's like an 80 degree day or a 60 degree day, the mind has beliefs for preference of temperature. You know, some like it hot, some like it cold. You know, climates and everything. But that's not the way it gets perceived because it seems like the sun is what makes it hot. You know, it seems like there's something on the screen. The sun makes me feel hot. The um, if I don't, if I don't put enough food in this body, then that's what makes me hungry. Not that the hunger has something to do with the belief in my mind, maybe with separating from God, but that I don't have enough food, so that's why I'm hungry. Or, you know, it's kind of like when we were growing up as little kids, you know, you remember, you know, it was like getting in a fight with your brother and sister or with a neighborhood child, you know, and running home to mom and saying, so-and-so made me so mad, they hurt my feelings, they did this, they hurt my feelings, you know, or my boss made me so mad, my boss told me, you know, told me off today and I'm just so fuming and I, I just lost my peace of mind and basically you can get a, start to get a sense of that the world's teaching, the ego's teaching is that there's always something on the screen that's the cause of my upset. And not only that, but there's always something on the screen that's the cause of my happiness, you know. That giant hot fudge sundae. I'm happy tonight because I got to eat my hot fudge sundae, you know, or I got the, the woman I was chasing all my life, she finally fell in love with me, and now I'm happy. We go into the sunset. The, the ego, no matter what it is, I got the right job, I got the right promotion, I got the right car, I'm living in the right area now. I finally wanted to live in San Diego, I've wanted my whole life to live in San Diego, and I'm happy because I'm in San Diego. And the Course is basically saying that that our happiness and our peace of mind and our upset has nothing at all to do with what's going on on the screen and everything to do with our perception of what's going on on the screen. When we go to a movie theater, you know, we, we go into a movie theater, we sit there at the movie theater and, and we may see like Terms of Endearment or some movie, you know, we may be laughing one minute and crying the next or, or really rooting for, for, the, for the heroine, you know, or really rooting against the, the villain. And basically, what what the course is saying is you're reading all the meaning that you're that you're all the feeling that you're feeling and everything that you're seeing in that movie. You're, you're it's coming from within you. Jesus says you never react to what happens directly. You always react to your interpretation of of what's happening. So what we need to work with is your correcting your interpretation or correcting your perception. Or another way of looking at it is. Out here on the screen is behavior. How many of us have, have tried to correct things in a behavioral sense? I'm too fat. I go on a diet. You know, I don't have enough money. I go get a better job. I, you know, I have a certain kind of illness. And so I go to a doctor, a specialist, who, who does an operation or gives me a particular kind of medicine. Or even behavior modification where, you know, where, where the mind will say, I want to be a good Christian. Like Jesus says, I want to be kind, so I'm going to try to have these. I'm going to try to be a kind person. Meanwhile, inside, a lot of times we've had the feeling where we're just uh, 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 we feel like we want to strangle the person, but we're trying to put on a nice mask because we think we want to, you know, do the kind thing. And what Jesus is saying is, forget about forget about your behavior. Behavior will follow automatically from your thoughts and your perceptions. You know, don't try to fix things out there, don't try to fix your behavior, but, but really follow me, follow me in as we go through perception and we go through uh, raising false beliefs up, and you'll really have a transformation of your mind, and then your behavior will automatically follow, you know. Doesn't that make sense, you know, intuitively, 
you can you can kind of see how this is going. I can I can see how that all makes sense, and uh, but I think what's confusing sometimes is where you know we're taught that what is out here is a reflection of what's in here, and then you think, okay, well let's go to the source here, and if we change or if this is changed, become one with God, then this will automatically follow the week, and it's unrealistic to think that, oh wow, you suddenly become millionaires, but if you come to the consciousness and really realize that you aren't lacking, um, um, or, you know, you're not sick, or, you know, whatever, wouldn't there be some kind, I mean, I understand that there would be a change of perception, a shift of perception, mm -hmm. but wouldn't there also be some kind of change in the outward world to, to reflect the change in the mind? Well, if that is a reflection of what is in the mind? Yeah, the, the, basically the, the error that comes in is that, that the deceived mind really believes that there is this thing called an objective world out there, a real objective world. In other words, it's apart from me and you, you know, that there's a world we can talk about and there are people here and we need seats and everything. And basically what the Course is leading to is that um, all perception, in a sense, is completely subjective. Every time any, any fragment looks through the ego's lens, he sees the world in a, in a distorted way. So there never was a lack in the first place. We never really were sick in the first place, and we really see that. Yeah. That's the shift. The shift you say, comes to the sense oh, of... what lack? Yeah. I mean, it's a real clarity of coming to see this choice where it is, and, and coming to see that it was just a misperception. But I know sometimes for myself, if I am faced with a big bear in the middle of the road of this dream that I'm in, then for me what has been helpful is to recognize that my goal for the day is the peace of God, just for today. Yeah. Sometimes that's all I can do. It really that simplifies it because it really brings it home what the important thing is to, to stay with the peace or to, to be open to the Holy Spirit's guidance. Uh, a lot of times, when you really get into the metaphysics and the deeper levels, as Ken Wapnick and other people have talked about, is that the Holy Spirit doesn't work in the world. Right. He's it's in my mind. Scary. And that's very scary. But it, there are a lot of passages in the Song of Prayer that basically say that the Holy Spirit will, will reach to you where you believe you are. So if you believe you're a mother, and you believe I've got three kids, and you know, and I only got five dollars left and everything, then when we really set aside the chatter and just really focus on peace as the goal, then we may receive uh, specific guidance on this is what you got to do next. You know, this is, you know, it's not like you can just sit there and go, okay, God is abstract and, and God doesn't really know about this world and this and that, because that's not helpful at all. But to focus on the peace and then be open to who to call maybe, what to, what to do next, you know, that, that makes it real practical that way. I think there's certain times too when I've always, you know, there's there's things that you'll say to yourself like, I will do the footwork and leave the outcome or whatever it is that gets you through that moment. Mm -hmm. But I've also recognized the times in my life that I have simply said a prayer of surrender in that I will let this go and not worry about it. I mean, I've often thought about, and I've told you this, about the story about the two women, or the man and a woman in London during the Second World War who had such utter and complete faith that they would be all right. I mean, I mean, to the bone kind of faith. You know, can't have any room for a niggling amount of doubt. They honestly believed that there, everything would just be okay, so they would totter along when the air raid drills were going off, and they would half the time forget to pull their blinds down. <laughs> and at the end of the war, every house in their block had been raised, and theirs there stood. But they're, they're, that, that's the kind of faith that I, I don't know, it's probably two steps to get to it, but you know, if, in those times in my life when I have simply said, I don't know what to do, mm -hmm. I assume something will come along and it will work out, it always has. Yeah. But you have to be willing to sort of let go of your of your attachment to results. Yeah. If I am a really, if I think this through and I work my mind in such a way, <coughs> it will project out into this world. I think the minute you do that, you're caught in separating yourself from, and you're seeing the world out there again. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, as soon as, it's a really good point because as soon as in the slightest way, you're even looking for a little bit of an outcome, or you're even going to judge and gauge how well you're doing by the outcome. I mean, that's the trap that a lot of people will fall into using this course with sickness. I mean, in a sense, yeah. here you're, you're getting to a path that's talking about sickness being a decision, and that our response, our state of mind is completely our own responsibility. There's nothing outside of us. We can't, 
there's no blaming God or blaming the medical model or blaming the doctors. You, you know, it just brings it home. 